Thank you. So guys, we'd like to have a seat. Thank you very much. And uh, today morning, uh, when I was, uh, you know, having my breakfast, as well as I woke up, I was always, you know, constantly thinking about IoT devices. It somehow went into my blood. It gave me an opportunity to go ahead and think, and then more think from the security perspective. What I learned in these last 24 hours before this particular session would have started, I learned more than what I actually got from my experience in terms of understanding a lot of architectures in these 24 hours. And uh, when I sit out here, it would be my first time in this particular conference to go ahead and speak before all of you. Not to take much time, I would like to go ahead and give a chance from uh, Ravi till uh, Kamal to go ahead and introduce themselves. And then we'll talk about some security aspects in IoT devices. Hi, um, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Ravi. I'm the founder and CEO of Quick Meeting. Uh, we are the world's smartest unified AI-powered business communication and collaboration app. Uh, we develop, uh, you know, innovative solutions, um, you know, in the space of communication and collaboration. Um, I've graduated from IIT Madras, uh, been a serial entrepreneur since then. Um, this is my fourth company, and uh, I'm a techie. I can code in 15 languages. Uh, been uh, an AI expert, has been working on AI kind of solutions since 2009, and that's about me. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. So over to you. Thanks, Ravi. I think uh, great intro. So about me, I'm Nitin, and I lead the product management for Cisco's security cyber, cyber security portfolio, and we'll, we'll definitely talk a lot about on the security stuff in terms of what exactly we are building and uh, what, what it entails from a security standpoint from, from the end-to-end -end security of a network. Um, prior to Cisco, I've worked with Hewlett Packard Enterprise and a cybersecurity startup called Sport Enix as well. And uh, during this journey, I've collaborated with a number of people across the board, have close to 15 patents in the field of cloud management, security, and blockchain. And that's also one of the reasons I was really excited about this opportunity and, and the panel today. Thank you for having us. Aviola. So my name is Abiola. I'm the senior manager for IT Controls and IHS Towers. So IHS Towers, we are in over 13 countries all over the world, um, South Africa, the whole of Africa, and also the Middle East. Um, so my major responsibility is to enforce um, IT frameworks within my organization, implement IT controls, look at all the controls from end to end for, for all the IT infrastructure within IHS. Um, prior to um, joining IHS, um, I, the project manager, I, le I led one of the biggest projects in my home country, Nigeria, and I have a couple of about 13 to 14 years working experience and a couple of certifications. So I want to say thank you to Confer Internet 2.0 Conference for bringing, giving me this opportunity to be able to, you know, discuss with the intellectuals in this panel session. Thank you. Thank you, Abiola. So over to Abbas, and uh, I would like to say something about Abbas. Abbas is a, you know, a gem of a person and a very good technical expert from the API and backend uh, related uh, aspects of coding. So Abbas. Thank you, JP, for the introduction. Hi, everybody. My name is Abbas uh, Basur. I am the CTO for Insider Group. Insider Group is essentially uh, a travel booking. Uh, uh, we, we want to revolutionize it the way uh, travel, travel agencies work. Um, you know, we, we prioritize hospitality, and we want to, uh, uh, you know, give, give the end user, you know, a really good experience when booking flights and hotels. Um, and we do a partnership with airlines and, uh, and hotels. Um, and um, I'm a backend engineer. I, des I design backend systems. I, I design APIs, um, utilizing best security practices as well as data science principles. Um, and thank you. Uh, How do you come out? Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is Kamal Taman. I'm a product management director for the products in Machine Stock. Uh, we are a Machine Stock. We are end-to-end uh, -end solution provider and product provider for the smart city and smart mobility and smart buildings. We have a focus uh, in a smart city and smart mobility actually for the last five years, uh, building our products. And we have a very you know, strong portfolio of our talking about already smart mobility, normal tracking for the, for the vehicles. And also, we are now 
uh, have a very strong products in the car sharing area and consumer part also. Uh, and as a smart city, we have a very strong already product regarding the uh, city management platform. And I think already the smart cities now, it's a very hot topic. And uh, yeah, and, uh, we heard a lot of about smart cities uh, the last two days. Uh, and also we have uh, the smart buildings board, which are concerning about how we can convert the digital experience for the workers inside the buildings and also the visitors. This is regarding already the uh, the uh, the machine stock, and also I am already founding a vision strategy. It's my uh, new PP. Uh, I'm trying to help already uh, the customers how can they are build their strategies in the small city area actually, and I'm very already interested to join this discussion today because we have a lot of things already uh, to talk. And uh, in the last two days. We have a lot of topics every day. We have a lot of ready topics can be added. So I, yeah, inshallah, we will enjoy together this session, inshallah. Okay. So to set the stage, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today morning, I would like to go ahead and uh, you know bring up to this particular floor a few aspects of IoT devices, where uh, in general we talk about that IoT itself as a word is very small, has three letters. But then you know you when you go into uh, you know all across your world. When you go into your day-to-day -day life, IoT devices have been already present and have taken a center stage right now from the prospect of giving more and more information so that we can go ahead and do analytics on top of them. Now, to set the stage for uh, all our uh, distinguished gentlemen out here, uh, we are talking about the end-to-end -end IoT solutions from the prospect of uh, autonomous vehicles, which probably Kamal would go ahead and take up, and then back-end and API-related security as well as coding-related security practices. For IoT, a bus is there. We have got the complete, uh, you know, program to be managed from the security uh, aspects in Nigeria. We have Abola out here. We have from Cisco a specialist who is into the security devices. Would go ahead and tell us how we can go ahead and best implement all these things, not only from the secure practices in networking, but also from the physical security of those particular devices. We have uh, Ravi out here who actually works on the actual data and then where he is working on the video conferencing portion of it, how to go ahead and make sure IT devices are integrated and security to be taken care of. Because there's a lot of information which goes in video and a lot of personal information or minutes or meeting and all those things, you know, go when you converse with somebody else. So we have tried to go ahead and see whatever is the limitation of uh, the panelists out here. We have seen whatever industry verticals we can go ahead and take. I would like to welcome also the participants who would like to come over and then you know jump in after this conversation to go ahead and you know give us more insight about if they have been using any of the IoT devices in their uh, field of work. So to start with, I will uh, directly jump to our specialist Nitin out here who can go ahead and explain us about the security practices and how Cisco is actually coming up with various <coughs> different particular solutions. Thanks, JP. I think one thing at Cisco we are very very focused on is the overall security. So Cisco's vision is to basically power an Im inclusive, feature, inclusive future for all. And that can only be happening once we have a good connectivity and a secure connectivity. So we basically have a one principle of if it is connected, it's protected. Now, when it comes to end-to-end -end IoT security, I think one of the biggest uh, security loopholes that we have seen recently is a DOS attack or a DDoS attack. So, which is a distributed denial of service. Now, when it comes to, a, just as an analogy, uh, just for, the, for, for everyone's uh, inputs, so think of it, think of a scenario where you're inviting your friends to a home party, right? Uh, so you expect like possibly five, six friends of you coming, coming to your place and uh, just, for a, just for a normal get together. But somehow, or some way, uh, out of those five and six friends, maybe one of those friends brought his or her friends as well, right? Uh, and the overall crowd gets to like 20, 25, 30, uh, 30 of the crowds. You were expecting five, 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 six friends of yours, but at the end, you end up having like 30, 50 people at, at your place. And it gets really, really chaotic, and you're not able to uh, go through all the services and all the hospitality that, hospitality that you thought that you'd bring to the table. That is essentially an analogy at a 10,000 feet overview on what exactly a DDoS attack looks like. So, which means you're denying a service because of extra traffic uh, at, at a particular location, which, is, which makes sure that, I mean, that is from an adversary point of view, that is the biggest, biggest drawback. 
Uh, that is that's something which we have seen. Lots and lots of adversaries, the hacker groups of the world, they are using this and exploiting this in, in a big way to make sure the legitimate traffic, the legitimate services are kind of brought down and the legitimate traffic is, is kind of not allowed into the network. That is basically in a nutshell on what a DDoS attack looks like. Now, we at Cisco are really focused on one of these parameters and we have a really amazing solution as well, which is known as Cisco Secure DDoS Edge Protection Solution, which makes sure all the DDoS attacks in the network are kind of pinpointed right at the first point in the network. What that means is, traditionally, <coughs> the industry has been used to solving a particular problem at the peering points, which is way too deep into the network. And what we are focusing right now is to make sure with the 5G advent, with IOTs, with user equipments, with botnets driving up the scale in a huge number, and in, in future we'll see 6G as well, the IOT, IOT game is definitely going to boom up. And these IOT devices can be used and hacked together to generate an illegal traffic or maybe a, a spoofed traffic, which can be used as a parameter for a DDoS attack. Now, with this solution, with, uh, Cisco has uh, basically taken a market lead in terms of providing the first mile connectivity, making sure the DDoS attacks are detected within milliseconds and you get high latency, sorry, you get high availability, very low ultra, late, ultra low latency in terms of mission critical applications are always up and running, and also to make sure that your network infra is kind of protected in, in its own way. So that's one of the one of the leads that we are trying to get and overall from a security standpoint to make sure we, we avoid the DDoS solutions right at the cell site router or right at the first point in the network contact. So coming to the uh, same thing when we talk about you know securing our IoT networks or any networks when you talk about ultra low latency. You know, uh, Abbas, uh, you remember we were discussing about something related to performance counters, how those performance counters would vary when some kind of an attack like this is happening. So how do you go ahead and suggest from the API standpoint or from a backend standpoint, how can you go ahead and measure them and then take care of it from this, you know, design and uh, structuring any of the software for IoT devices? Sure, sure. Yeah, so denial of service attack is a very uh, severe attack and if it, um, once it hits, it's, it hits really hard and it's really hard to recover. So some recommendations for uh, preventing DDoS attacks would be rate limiting. Um, think of data as water. Um, water uh, is essentially, we don't want to receive a lot of requests from a client or a, or a device. So we want to limit how much data can be pulled and how many times it, it can be pulled. So essentially, if we um, introduce rate limiting, we um, you know, limit only three requests per user, um, and it can only request this amount of data. That way we know for sure that we, the server won't be over, um, overloaded and such leaks, such data leaks um, won't, won't be bound to happen because you know, we took the precautionary effort to secure our um, access endpoints. So yeah, that's my solution for preventing DDoS attacks. So Kamal, when we talk about uh, smart cities, autonomous vehicles, and any of the machine learning related algorithms or anything, what you are designing, anybody can pitch in on this because I believe all of you know about it. And from the smart cities pr perspective, Abuela is also having quite good enough amount of knowledge what she's implementing. So these kind of attacks, when they are happening on any public infrastructure also, so how do you see the security you know, moves plus also, you know, autonomous vehicles are using it. Uh, plus, you know, you must be using it on electrical poles. You must be gathering weather data. You must be gathering traffic information. So how do you go ahead and see the future that, you know, security can be embedded and uh, not only from the prospect of software, but also how do you physically secure these IoT devices from tampering? Uh, actually, Yanni, the IoT, if we're talking about end-to-end uh, -end, end -end IoT products or solutions, uh, uh, it's a very challenging of, of we are talking about the security. Yani, uh, regarding the IoT, we have already a value chain starting from device. This device can be directly connected to the software or platform or can be directly connected through the gateway. So device, gateway, platform. And some another already, uh, another, another integration options or uh, architectures, this device can be connected device to the gateway to the software, which is already the middle layer. 
and then to the platform. So if we are talking about already data coming from device, it have at least, at least, at least two or three already uh, points or integration points can be added. If we are talking about the platform layer, in the platform layer we have a lot of really integrations should be done because now IoT is not already just a solo, just handling the use case of its IoT itself. It requires a lot of integration with multiple systems to handle the case of end to uh, end, end. We will do some reflection regarding the mobility and safety uh, later, but what is the most important thing we should have in the IoT actually, we have a different already component and this component should be already totally secured. If we are talking about the device itself, uh, yeah, I mean, if we are talking about the smart city and smart, mobili and so smart mobility, this, this already devices, it's around the streets, it's already geographically spread over the cities. So how we can make sure that already this device, it's already secured, secured in terms of sending the right data, not hacked, sending or any, uh, with already the right firmware, and no one can already access this already firmware sending, not already uh, sending already the data, which is already not be uh, useful, is the first important thing. The second thing, if we're talking about uh, physically secured, because it's a very, very important thing, because yeah, most of people and most of security guys is concerned about the software and how we can secure software. However, in the IoT device security is a very important, it's very important. Some devices and some use cases, we are dealing with the device as a users actually, not so the accessibility for the device not coming from the platform itself. So it's not already from platform to the device. Actually, some use cases like already smart home use cases, you can access directly the, the device. And if we're talking about already accessibility for the device, we have a different already con connectivity, already uh, connectivity scenarios. We have a short range connectivity if we're talking about already device connectivity and long, long range already connectivity. And short range connectivity, I think this is a very critical issue regarding security because most of short range one and most commonly used it's Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi. And yeah, and for the security guys, Bluetooth and uh, Wi-Fi, it's a uh, big risk. We, we are very afraid of it, you know. Those rogue Wi-Fi connections coming in yes. many times. We have to take care of it. So how do you suggest Wi-Fi being used, you know, for IoT devices? Actually, what is the future with Web 3.0? I, I believe, in the, if we are talking about already the Bluetooth, I believe already Bluetooth technology is not already, uh, it's not secure one. So in use case, you can replace Bluetooth, please do it, okay? Uh, however, now there are a lot of pro a lot of products in the mobility area actually is using Bluetooth, Bluetooth and already there are a lot of security concerns. So for the Wi-Fi, I think there are uh, uh, solutions uh, coming from many vendors to secure the Wi-Fi connectivity. And I think already Cisco have a very strong product in this area. How they can make sure that already this device is sending the right data and with with already the, the normal behavior. However, I think already there are another thread can't be already, can't be already uh, tackled regarding the accessing of data for the privacy. Someone already can, uh, can access already the Wi-Fi using the, any, the normal already or, or the default username and password because if you are talking about consumer, no one concerned about the security for the consumer base. But already the solution for, for Cisco is already how they can manage already the data coming from device to the platform and already how this already device is sending the right data with not abnormal behavior. Another, another topic, uh, if we're talking about really the flow from device to the platform, it's already sometimes we have integration with subsystems. Like if you have already use case in the smart, in smart cities like parking, irrigation, sometime you are using software for the parking and irrigation and integrate this, device, this already system to your IoT platform with the unified one. In this part, I think already APIs is uh, playing a very, very, uh, very, very critical already role in this part. Uh, so this part of already of integration between the already subsystem to the platform, and another uh, another aspect regarding the integration between the platform itself and the services. If you are talking about smart city, we should integrate with 911, with already with the customer uh, for with the resident portals. So the integration is very very critical now, and I think yani, most of yani, tech guys is already preferring to have APIs and. There, there are already a very strong products so for talking about already this one, like API managers and ASP, ASP applying the right policy for the APIs and applying already the performance for the APIs itself. 
So the criticality from end to end IoT use cases is coming from already different already components, and this all of this component is already communicating with different protocols, with different integration options. So when we are thinking about already security in IoT, we should think already of starting from device till the application layer. In the automotive industry, actually, there are a high risk actually because most of already use cases now. Uh, and automotive industry is, is moving from just normal tracking for the vehicles itself to be a control of the vehicles itself. So it's now we are talking about already life of people, life of human actually. So security is very critical now. And now we are talking about the car sharing. So each car it should be already available, like already you drive and already and the uh, e-car which is already spread everywhere. So you have to access the car itself. So if you don't apply a right security rules, it can be accessible for anyone. So securing the endpoints, what you mean is a very important part between all the components starting from any, any IoT device and then the data being transmitted from the IoT device to the staging stage and then going to a data warehouse ultimately to go ahead and do a reporting data. But what about the live feed for some of these where you see, you know, what in modern technology we also use certain kind of, you know, communication between drones or certain kind of communication which is happening through the IoT devices which are more vulnerable in nature. So again, endpoint security is one, but tempering with the device itself, how do you alert people? How do you suggest we can alert, you know? the person who is controlling it. Any, any security practices maybe you would like to also go ahead and pitch in on top of it? I think you can add something here. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Thank you very much for that question. So um, simply put, when you, when you want to bring up the highest device, so th the first thing you need to actually implement are the frameworks, right? The security frameworks. So we have a couple of security frameworks because if you don't put like a framework in place, how, how, how are you expected to be able to comply or what, what are the requirements for you to do your compliance with, which is very important for an organization. So right, we have a couple of frameworks. So for for the IoT, um, we have the stand, International Standard Organization um, Framework for IoT, basically, which is the 31141 Framework, where it actually defines how you... Con so th 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 there are three parts into it. So we have the conceptualism model, okay? We have the reference model, and we have the reference architecture. So it, it simply tells you how you're supposed to put the IoT um, concept in place. So we have the way the, 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 the reference talks about the trustworthiness of your IoT. So things like confidentiality, things like integrity, availability, okay? Um, how you protect the personal identity of whatever devices or whatever information or data is being transferred. And in terms of the architecture model, we, we we're talking about um, the, the, the network connectivity, we we're talking about the oper operability of the devices. So a couple of things that you need to put in place and how do you put that in place is to set a policy for it, right, from, from an organization standpoint. And that's for in terms of how the IoT devices are supposed to be in place, right? But in terms of the cyber security policies, we have the likes of ISO 27001 where we have about 14 domains within ISO 27001. Now for the 14 domains, we have a couple of controls in place, about, about 114 controls in place where the organization is supposed to identify um, standpoints or the domains within it in e.g. your assets management. So for IoT devices, we see them as assets, right? So how is the organization supposed to put, what are the controls the organization is supposed to put in place to protect such devices, right? Um, we we'll talk about when you know, the life cycle of a device from acquire to retire. So how do you retire the device? at the end of the day. Um, so that's ISO 27001. We have the, another framework, which is the NIST framework for cybersecurity. Now, the NIST framework came into play when, from an executive order, when we, there's, there's a need for, for us to put cybersecurity framework in place. So we have about five domains within, in, within that where we have the ident identify. So the identify has to do with what are the, um, what are the risk management processes you've put in place. So, can I send something about um, identifying the, the risk and also how do you mitigate it? So it's like more like a risk assessment that you're supposed to do within the organization, identify all those risks that has to do with cybersecurity. Then in the protect 
model of the NIST framework. So PROTECT has to do with um, what are the information security awareness you put in place, the training we we'll put in place, because believe it or not, you, you can put a robust information security um, program in place, but the weakest point are the human elements, which you know the last, the last presenter actually highlighted. So how do you prevent that? So it's detailed information security awareness for all the, the human elements, the employees, your suppliers, your customers. So also now put in, um, um, access control in place for the preventive. Now for the detective, um, you need to put a mechanism in place that even though you have a, a, a robust preventive measure in place. How do you detect if something goes wrong? So those mechanisms need to put in place, right? And also in terms of recover, so let's say for example, there, there was an attack or, or on a hack in your IoT devices. How do you recover? What are the plans you have in place? The procedures you have in place to recover from such attack, right? So those are the um, frameworks you need to put in place when you're setting up like a robot IoT um, device in your organization. Next time, Debbie, so to go ahead and make sure that you know we all are working on different components. But when I come to Ravi, Ravi ultimately is uh, taking care of an actual data and video conferencing information, your pictures, your actual data. So he has to come to every one of us to go ahead and make sure Cisco is securing his infrastructure. To come to so for software development, he has to come to again for backend to API securing, he has to come to Abbas, right? Although you know 15 languages. But the point is, and IoT devices, you have to go back to, you know, Kamal, and then for cyber security, you might have to go ahead and come back to Abiola that how you can go ahead and, uh, you know, implement those frameworks. And of course, as a GRCP person, I come over from the yes. practice that from data center, right? So my uh, whole uh, work has been in terms of making sure I'm securing not only data centers, but also secure, you know, using all of uh, these gentlemen's, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, aspects of security, and then making sure we are delivering it ultimately to the application owners or to any of the product owners, proper secure base platform. So they can develop something which is more secure as well as they can go ahead and make sure that the data is secured at rest as well as on the net. Now, what is your take on using all of you know, these kind of technologies and your point from the prospect of bringing your video conferencing system on uh, the IoT devices or in general how IoT can go ahead and be more secured in such cases. I think that that's a fantastic way to put, right? So, you know, we, we build uh, the, uh, the, the final solutions for our customers and as you rightly put, um, there's a lot of security from a data center perspective that we require. Uh, because a lot of questions asked for, asked for my customers is where is my data going to be stored when I'm doing these conferences, where, where is my minutes that we generate through AI is actually stored. And these are all, um, you know, definitely uh, from a data security perspective, it is becoming imperative um, that, you know, if, um, these, the protocols that we use to communicate to these all IoT devices becomes very imperative. And, and for that word, uh, what we also develop is a lot of uh, technologies um, on the security front. Um, so we have developed our own um, technology or innovation, uh, which is called enterprise data cocooning, right? Where at an enterprise level, how can we secure all this data coming from all these things, right? So we connect to their conference rooms, to the IoT devices there. There's a lot of data that is coming up, and how do we secure that and put it in, in you know, in, in a place where uh, where somebody cannot go and hack it, right? So so these are something that we're constantly innovating on. We're we're also taking a few patents on that as well. And and when when we when it comes to um, especially the conferencing and the IoT devices there, um, even though they, they have kind of a physical security already because they're in, in from, from the office environment they have, but the problem comes when it comes to the home in how you do conferencing, let's say in a hybrid environment, yeah, right? Yeah. And now, when it comes to that, you know, you know, you know, uh, you know the DDoS attacks that are being used. So, what many hackers or uh, you know, uh, especially uh, people who create malware, is target these kind of devices at homes, right? Uh, where you might be using a camera or something which you think is secure, but it can be used um, in in a botnet and um, can um, create these DDoS attacks across the um, networks. And I think that's where you know uh, we're also investing ourselves in. In fact, we are talking to a, um, a, 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 a distributor in uh, UK, where they, they provide this kind of high-end secure devices at home 
and we are we are trying to integrate with their we are solutions. More than welcome to come to us also. <laughs> also <laughs> yeah, and and yeah, it's a, it's a it's a as you rightly put, it it actually involves a lot of complexity, okay. and I think we have enough technologies. Um, so it, it, especially after COVID, after we see a lot of bombing happening across the conferences and all, you know, a lot of solutions have been invented. Like for example, end-to-end -end encryption, so that if somebody comes, you know, you will not he will not be able to come in because he will not have the right keys to. Uh, you know, uh, know uh, put his video out and send it across to the things. So, and also from a secure point of view, we have created one of the world's most AI powered secured meeting rooms, um, which is like no one can enter into those rooms. And the data that we create in these rooms is basically encrypted and stored uh, in a very, very secure manner. So right? data so at rest is also encrypted. What type of encryption uh, do you suggest to anybody because you have been constantly using it in the current environment? Yeah, so basically, you know, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, encryptions we use, um, especially at data at rest, we use AES and uh, those kind of encryptions right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is also, uh, you know, a lot of uh, encryption happens on the transit, where, for example, uh, we want to, uh, for example, you're, you're doing a, using an IoT device, communicating your video uh, uh, to it. So what we take is that, that that video is encrypted at the at the point of origin and then sent to it and that's called end-to-end -end encryption so we exchange these keys so we use a lot of again for exchanging these keys which are also secure again there are certain protocols that we use to exchange these keys so that so it the PKI can, infrastructure yeah the pki and, sure, and then you go ahead and make sure that you know your exactly handshake is happening and all those things and so aec 256 is definitely a very strong uh, encryption but nowadays they are going on a you know a higher level also yes have yes. you ever thought about it that you can go on a higher level it will definitely hit your performance we know that encryption hits the performance as well as when you talk from iso 27001 uh, perspective i have seen a lot of you know companies when i do audits also so i see a lot of companies uh, in their statement of applicability they go ahead and minus out 10.1 into if it is not you know, uh, required as part of the controls when you put in ISO 27001. Why the reason is because, you know what, any of these companies when they go ahead and use it on net when they are encrypting it, even they do uh, have the end-to-end -end encryption from the, or on endpoints they have encryption because it hits the performance of the software very largely. And I have actually tested seven or eight years back when I was in US in GSK to be very precise. I applied encryption on my open systems on all uh, the data at rest and uh, it hit me around, you know, more than 80% of the time was increased automatically in terms of transactions happening. So video compression and then encryption. So how does it happen? You know, so you want to go ahead and make sure that if you have to deal with the performance and a trade off between security and performance. So how do you go ahead and manage it? Um, it, it definitely is. So there are ways uh, in which we kind of do this end-to-end -end encryption uh, at a very, very, I mean, we don't use, uh, for example, AES kind of technologies for that kind of encryption. Um, there, there are basically kind of uh, encryptions which would just change the, uh, uh, with, the, with a certain code, they change the pixels and kind of encrypt it and send it back. So that is the easiest format of encryptions that, you know, you can do to uh, not affect com uh, the performance much. Uh, but yes, uh, but at the end of the day, the server is always sending the, the things that is coming in and forwarding it to the, so we call it as an SFU, right, where it's a standard forwarding unit where it takes up the video streams, audio streams, and just, you know, renders it to the other persons, right? Now, what happens is, the, because the encryption happens at the, at the point of origin, and the decryption happens at the thing, um, the load is mostly on the on the systems that you know that you're looking at. On both the systems. Yeah, on, on the both the systems, right? And that's where you know we use very very subtle encryptions at that stage. And you, you're right in terms of uh, protocols, right? For example, um, you, there's a lot of support for AES 256. For example, we use SQL servers and all that, so where it's available readily, right? Now, if you want to go for higher kind of encryptions. Uh, we need to wait because um, I think it's more than more more than enough right now with these technologies. As you know, it can, as you rightly said, yes, um, there are systems, powerful systems, enough to hack. You know, in the future, going to hack this. So but TD is going to become older now. You know, transparent <laughs> data encryption yes, is going yes. to become older yeah. going forward. Yeah. So uh, moving uh, back again uh, to the again, again to everybody in the forum out here. So lastly, I would like to go ahead and uh, get comments from you as well as any kind of participation uh, rather than questions, any kind of participation on this particular part where we talk about risk-based approach because assets are increasing in IoT. When we talk about IoT, there are millions of IoT assets. If you go for smart cities, if you go for autonomous vehicles, if you design something for it, if you secure it, right? 
Now in such cases, what happens is that you know what you have to go ahead and do an asset based uh, you know risk analysis. Now usually we see that even if we are, uh, I am personally running uh, the risk uh, related aspects in a data center or in one of the biggest telco in India. So how do we do is we group it because there is a limited number of uh, assets. So we group those assets and we go ahead and do a risk based uh, analysis on them. And then we go ahead and uh, do the RCE projects prioritization that which particular risk needs to be taken care of, which we can go ahead and mitigate, which we can accept at the end of the day. But from uh, the prospect of IIT devices, there cannot be you know a grouping of 1 million devices and the risk can be analyzed because it has to be again based on the environment again based on that position even one small uh, you know uh, what you call is a traffic light where you have an iit device installed in a smart city would differ from the other traffic light and its risk would be different right it is near some different area it is near some mall it is near some you know vulnerable uh, position so the risk factor uh, definitely changes from that perspective so there is an approach where you need to go ahead and divide them into different type of you know groups which would go ahead and lead to uh, you know small medium and high risk in these three categories and again subgrouping them and then taking that particular information out so this is a risk based uh, approach for when you go ahead and do asset based risk uh, analysis or asset based related uh, uh, risk profiling when you are doing it. Once you do that profiling, we see that you know what, what is the vulnerability for any of these particular devices, IoT devices, and a grouping of those devices and subgrouping. And then we go ahead and decide on it that how do we go ahead and counter those particular, uh, you know, uh, say for example, problems what have arrived. So your threat and vulnerability based assessments at the end of the day, when we go ahead and see in your softwares, in your, uh, you know, equipments, in maybe an application what you are generating or from the network perspective and uh, from the GRCP perspective what we do on a usual basis. So penetration testing, security testing and passing out all these particular portions, you all have to go ahead and make sure that you know all components at every point in time would go ahead and work properly and they are secured, then only we will be able to go ahead and have a secure future. This is uh, the final take from my side and any other comments on that? Uh, actually, yani, yani, we are facing this challenge in what we're talking about, the smart cities especially. Yani, we, we are working with many big customers and they are requiring more than 20 use cases. 20 use cases means that already you have more than 20 vendors of devices. And sometimes already you have a 20 vendor of devices and sometimes we have a more than this because in the speci specific use case, you, show you maybe have a device from vendor and the gateway from another vendor and another device from this vendor to, to be able to, draw, to, to, to provide the, the one use case. If we're talking about like smart parking or smart irrigation device, some, sometimes from vendor and the gateway from another vendor. So I think this is already a very critical one if we're talking about already the criticality of, of uh, security and your approach regarding grouping of the devices itself, it's very important. And if we can divide this based on vendor because each vendor have his specific security rules and also his specific integration protocols because some, 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 some of, already of, of vendors they are using already uh, TCP over, uh, TCP IP over HTTP, not only using HTTPS, sometimes already using MQTT. So grouping by the vendor, it's a very important thing because we have a different vendors, how we can manage vendors, how we can make sure that already the vendors are applying the security from device itself. is already a, a, a one aspect. And another aspect regarding the use case itself. Some already we have a, some use cases, we just reading the data, just monitoring the data. If we're talking about already environmental monitoring, just already read the data. Uh, it's already, uh, the, the device, it's a lower risk than another device can do the action. Like already, if I have already smart parking, so the gate, we should already send the command for the gate itself to close or open. So another aspect regarding the use case, it's, already, it's a criticality of the use case itself. Another use cases we are talking about already is a smart mobility one, and we are now most of already smart mobility guys is using uh, campus. As campus already, is, as we are connecting the, this campus over the protocol of car itself, so we can read the data from the car. And some use cases we can already also not read or write already, so we can send a command for the car stop engine, uh, do already uh, AC on and off. So the another aspect 
transformed vendor is already it's a use case, it's a use case itself. So we can divide it already a high, medium, low, and critical based on the use case, case itself. And using this grouping, as you mentioned, based on different aspects of security, vendors, and the use case, it will help us already from the layer of already of management as managing already different vendors and different use cases will help us already to apply the right already uh, security rules over the this use cases here. And the most critical one already regarding the smart city now, most of already customers is using this, the IoT to operate the city. And now we are talking about operation of city. And if we're talking about hacking or any security concern, actually it will affect our lives. And in, we are engaging with many customers, they are or they are seeking for the operation center for the city, actually. So I, when I'm already proposing with some solutions, I can imagine if any hacker can access this already platform and access this device, it will be an, a very, very critical issue. So security in the IoT is very important, especially with pressure from the customers to be already, not just already monitoring, actually we are using this IoT applications to manage our lives. So I believe yani, uh, it's, our, it's a topic so is so very critical. In this case, you can go ahead and uh, have a secured layer where your IoT devices, they themselves are you know, collecting the data and keeping it there. And there is a segregation of network. When we talk about that data being transmitted through APIs and pull and push mechanisms, whatever it is, to uh, the final SOC, which is you know, security is not what you're talking about in security centers. So your data is getting transmitted later, but uh, your problem, I believe, in any kind of security center would be to go ahead and response on a real time at any point in time when you can go ahead and reach out to that particular place, right? So that is one of the aspects which we can go ahead and look into that how security can be, you know, managed. Plus, of course, if somebody is coming and connecting a device out there that is still more secure and uh, considered from the risk point of view when I do my risk analysis rather than having a Bluetooth or a, you know, IEEE kind of a device connecting to those particular devices. So we try to go ahead and see those ports as well as uh, those communications should not be allowed in any of those particular kind of IoT devices. So that is why my take on, uh, you know, securing it by segregation of networks in uh, when connecting to SOC or from security operation centers. That, that's how we do it usually in organizations also and for data center as well as for our security knock also we do it. Just, just on the on the similar note, right, uh, Kamal, you you raised up a great point in terms of smart cities and making sure the IoT connectivity is is kind of secure. Uh, just to kind of elaborate, I think there was uh, an attack which is known as the Workada attack. So Workada is basically a camera surveillance uh, organization which was kind of compromised. It had a breach, and the hackers could literally access hundred thousands or basically. 200 thousands of cameras all across the places which were which were installed those were located at high secure high security areas prisons schools hostels and and whatnot so it, it becomes really really critical to kind of uh, to your point come right it, in, in in making sure who is able to access their data and how are we storing their data which becomes it can have a real real big implications in terms of a smart cities projects which are already going on yeah, speaking of how to um, store data, so one vital thing we actually need to you know, consider is um, the data privacy law in each country, right? So we have the likes of Saudi that have, looks at the PDPL, with the likes of UK, GDPR. So um, when you're looking at data security entirely, you want to look at, okay, uh, based on the data privacy laws in that country, how do you intend to store their data within the confinement of, of their country? And what, what, what that simply means is that um, you need to invest more, the, the organization needs to invest more to make sure that the data within that country is you know, protected within that country. So how do you plan to go ahead and uh, regulate uh, usage of IoT devices in uh, your country at any point in time in future because these are going to go ahead and grow in a very large quantity? Any regulations which you're going to go ahead and try and see your regulatory body can bring in on picture where Nigeria or where other you know, uh, countries which are nearby can utilize it concerned to, you know, 30141 which you were actually elaborating on. Yeah, thank you very much for that. So for Nigeria, we have the likes of GDPR, um, the data privacy law that, that, that speaks to how to protect um, data privacy for Nigerians. And so, so, so for, for big organization, right, that spans across different countries. So what, what that means is that you need to look at the, the data privacy laws within that country, within a particular country they're operating in, and which means it has to be different for 
every other country, all the countries you're, you're operating in. And um, that, that brings to the point of you don't need to have just one policy. So that, that, that is not, it's not one shoes that fits you know, the entire organization. So depending on the regulation or depending on the, or the privacy law within um, the different countries you're operating in, you need to have specific policies for those countries. Excellent. So Excellent. if Ravi would like to go ahead and implement Excellent conversation. a large-scale solution in I, I just want to add something real quick. Really quick, really quick, really quick. So we, we talked we talk about cryptography, right? Um, I just want to mention that um, AES isn't the only type of cryptography. There are thousands of types of cryptography. Just earlier, I was reading about um, elliptical, uh, elliptical curve cryptography. So in, in other ways, like, don't use the most standard, um, the most standard uh, one out there because hackers are also working day and night to try to break it. So I mean, um, yeah, so, um, and, and, and to, to, go, to go to Kamel's uh, uh, conversation about vehicles, um, a proposal would be, um, you know, any, anybody can get a diagnostic tool and configure uh, the ECUs for a vehicle however they want. So uh, potentially as el vehicles are becoming more electric and they're becoming more software, software dependent, dependent on software based, um, you know, having the cloud be the source of being able to configure um, anything in the vehicle, um, you know, we can, uh, the, you know, some, some implementations could be to um, add, a, add expiration to whatever you send and add um, signing of configurations. That way nobody, like not the general user, can insert whatever they, they think they want or they think they want the, the vehicle to do. And I think that's a good ending note. So, so continuing with that same discussion on autonomous vehicles, we talk about autos, autosar, right? When we go ahead and start designing something where we are controlling the engine. And when you go ahead and design some application for a while, you know, touch screen and a dashboard in those new modern cars which are coming, but whether it is electric or whether it is not, electric would add some more software related aspects to it. But now coming to that point, where you need to go ahead and segregate, as we are talking about segregation of network, we are talking about now segregation of two different particular aspects. One is related to the mechanical working of the car and the other one is the dashboard, which is giving you the information out of it, right? And analytics out of it on your dashboard at what speed you're running on it. Now what happens is, is that when you start integrating certain applications or softwares out there, automatically that dashboard becomes more vulnerable. So AutoSAR has its own security model it will go ahead and do segregation at that particular end, if you look at it. Otherwise, somebody would easily go ahead and connect to it and can go ahead and tamper with your you know, mechanics while you are driving and you might face an uh, untoward incident out there. So that is where you know, security from the automobile perspective also, which I want to put, has standards and they are very stringent standards. Nobody till now has been able to go ahead and break even in that particular market like AutoSAR has been doing it, it's doing fantastic job with the security modules of that. I'm still, you know, trying to gauge what exactly, you know, our uh, dear Jamun brothers have made that AutoSAR from, you know, kind of. So it's a serial bus kind of a communication, but then let's see, you know, in future we might get a lot of different things coming up. Uh, actually, I mean, uh, for, the, for the use cases or for the, uh, which is already the vehicle manufacturer itself is providing the part of already of controlling the car. I believe I mean, it's uh, less risk than any another use case. But uh, now we are talking about already the new cars and already it will be the evolution of to be already software defined, defined vehicles, which already it will be already uh, sooner. But now there are a lot of use cases and the demand, and demand in the market to convert the existing vehicles, which already mechanical one to be a smart one. So here it's coming to have external devices with external already setup with the protocols to be play the game of this already of this role. So here it's risk itself. But regarding the automotive, if we are talking about BMW, Mercedes, or whatever, they are playing great because they are already responsible for the tech starting from the vehicle itself till the software. The risk is coming already from the product that's already it's dealing with old cars. Here it's a very huge risk, and I think already, and already, here it's already a security guy is already uh, in role to how we can make sure already everything is working fine, working with already a, a secure, already uh, secure way. And mm -hmm. yani, we have a lot of discussions, I think, yani, and a lot of corner cases so happened before, so we exactly. can <laughs> we can explore it more. Yani, explore yani, it more, uh, right. I mean, we have been discussing about a lot of industries out here, how security, you can go ahead and take care of an IoT devices, but uh, we did not 
pick up, you know, banking and financial sector to be precise, where PCI DSS plays or PA DSS plays a very important part. We've got those devices also which are handheld devices, and then we have got, you know, our mobility related applications. So it is a it is a vast topic, you know, when we talk about IoT, security, handheld devices, all those are also considered as something where, you know, where we need to go ahead and make sure the transactions are going to get secured. So probably it's always a next time when we can go ahead and talk about it. <laughs> but the forum is open for any questions or any suggestions from your side, uh, audience, we'd like to go ahead and put it, uh, put the floor open for all of us. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. There's, okay. There's been a lot of discussions which have happened around IoT uh, at a in the in an office environment or probably uh, in a in an automotive environment. But I would want to understand the view of this panel on IoT devices when it comes to home. Just like your television or your refrigerator or even uh, you know the one which is projecting the projector. Right, because a lot of things when we are talking today, we are talking, we have to talk, uh, I mean, uh, probably in the realm of cyber physical security, right? How humans interact with IoT devices. And as an example, when we go back home, uh, we probably use the same network where we are connecting our corporate devices and we are connecting this IoT devices also. So how does data, boosting data security in that environment uh, maybe some some ideas from your side. So the so the basics are very clear. When we go ahead and talk about, we divide any kind of data into two different uh, you know aspects. When I look at it from the security standpoint, I would also like uh, Ravi to go ahead and pitch in about because he is mostly dealing into video conferencing piece. Where you know if we take that video conferencing IoT device at home and we are using it, then how does it work? And then in Cisco we have got IP phones or uh, Cisco is nowadays providing home related devices also where we can go ahead and do communication. So what we do is as I said, we divide data into two different type of uh, aspects when we talk about security, when we go ahead and try to secure them. Data at rest and data at net is very important. These are the two concepts which you know I don't see anywhere in my whole life will change ever. So data at rest, when we are talking about, we are talking about data at rest, even if you go at the home, uh, take take your laptop back to home and you're working on your network using VPNs. But data at rest, when it is in your laptop, when it is in an IoT device, where you are touching it to start uh, the fan, where you are touching it to go ahead and do video conferencing with the small device, which is next to your switch, you would like to always go ahead and make sure that there is sufficient amount of encryption, which is there, not only covering that particular data, but also the operating system, which is being used at this point in time. So of course, so when you do encryption, we are talking about AES-256, which is still can be broken by quantum computing, as uh, we have one of the specialists from Cisco who can go ahead and elaborate more on quantum computing right now. The second portion is of, you know, data at net. When that data is encrypted and it has to be passed to somebody else through a public, uh, you know, internet uh, where we are talking about. So then we have got protocols, we have got, you know, TLS uh, 2.0 right now, which is in uh, function. We have got HTTPS, we are using different kind of APIs directly to connect which are secured. So all these kind of things would play a very important part piece by piece. All endpoints need to be secured. It cannot be a single phase, you know, just that we are securing it through an encryption. But it has to be majorly everything which we have to go ahead and consider from the standpoint of when we are taking any of our laptops, or IoT devices, or handheld devices back home. So all those things play a very important part with segregation of data, segregation of network. How do you communicate from your home to your office or from your uh, home-based IoT device to the ultimately data where it is going to reside or data where it is going to get transmitted to. So those two aspects will never change in my life, even if we have 3.0 functions. Yeah, just to quickly add there, um, I think uh, the connection, right, at the device at the time when you buy it and connect it to a particular uh, system, I think there's a lot of technology that has been evolved there. Um, earlier, there used to be these default passwords and all that used to be there. Now they're kind of removing that, and they're all connected to your, like, you know, um, you connect through your phone, through the Wi-Fi, through the phone, and things like that. I think that gives a lot of security, um, and the earlier devices didn't have, right? So I just wanted to thought, like, you know, tell you that there's a lot of advancements in the technology in the space, especially from a home IoT device connectivity 
connectivity side and um, and, and this whole connectivity that starts at the point when you purchase the device to you connect to a particular network or a particular account of yours. I think that's where a lot of uh, critical security aspects are taken care of. So just to add to that, um, so I think recently we got, you know, we just set up the, our Wi-Fi, right? And um, the technician asked us to put the password. So uh, my husband puts just a couple of numbers there, right? So I was like, no, you can't put just numbers. You need to have complex passwords. So you can start with that, right? So number one, like um, you had said, you need to, for default password, just change all the default password. Then number two, have, make sure the password is complex enough so nobody, maybe your neighbors around have just simple tools. Because we can download these simple tools from the internet and just simply, you know, uh, brute force your weak password. So setting complex password, change um, default passwords. Thank you. So ISO 3141 has been released in 2018. Uh, there are some parts which are coming to it. But if I go back to ISO 27001, where we are talking about part B, where controls are there. So primarily, if IoT device is nothing but sometimes when you use an IoT device, you use a Unix-based system in that IoT device is a skimmed version of an operating system to go ahead and project something or do some work for you from, for, you know, creating an application so that you can have a touch screen, you click on that button, it starts your light. Now what you do is, you ultimately follow the same rules. What you have to go ahead and do from the information security standpoint and those controls in the part B of ISO 27001, which is already available with us, part two. So we need to go ahead and make sure, firstly, we have to go ahead and follow all those particular security best practices. Of course, push, pushing of patches is a very prominent part in IoT devices because every time you'll see you know, a new vulnerability comes up. So when you go ahead and make sure that the IT devices, those millions of IT devices are you know, away from us, how do you have a patching mechanism which you have to take care of? So BAVA or VAPT, when you are doing any kind of you know, patching for the application also, or you're uh, you know, releasing new releases. So all these things are a very critical part of it, which has to be controlled through some kind of a secure mechanism. That is where the second portion of the data which is going in and out on the network has to be secured. So I believe both these parts, as I said, data at rest and data at net, how do you do it, is very important from the security perspective. It will never change for the whole life. I hope we answered some part of your question or fully. No, that's again at the technology side. When I right. talk about cyber physical, there's a human element which comes into play. As an example, one of the casinos in Las Vegas was breached through a fish tank, through an aquarium, right? Or let's say there's a recent report I read where a lot of phishing emails came through a refrigerator connected to the internet. So what I'm saying is the home appliances play an equal or maybe a more important role when it connects to the corporate world. When we are talking about third party risks, when you're talking about a connected world, right? So to basically segregate these two in today's borderless world which we are talking about, where data is everywhere, is probably, I feel, not might, might not be the right approach. So yes, there are frameworks, but there are embedded systems as well, right? So if you're connecting, I mean, something which, when you're connecting your refrigerator as an IoT device, or probably the smart uh, lights, these are embedded devices. A lot of things are not known about it. So how do you, you know, basically address those risks? I'm talking about risk. Technology, yes, we are talking about encryption, tokenization, GDPR, we are talking about CCPA. We are talking about a lot of those regulations, standards, all that is fine. But what the need of the hour, the way I look at it is, how do we manage the weakest link, which is the physical element, the human element, rather than the technology element? And probably if you can shed a little bit more light on that, I would appreciate it. So one very uh, good point which you have brought in out here, you know, it will bring me to a situation where, you know, I personally use, what, what do I personally do at my house? Now, a lot of people, you know what, all techies would like to get more speed, you know, I want more speed, I'm working from home, it was COVID two years. But you know, everybody was uh, running over to those ISPs and then you know, provide me a fastest bandwidth at my home and then make sure, you know, I have got a Wi-Fi network all across in my rooms, all my devices probably would be connected to that. So Wi-Fi to be precise is very vulnerable at any point in time. Keeping this in mind, I always try to go ahead and see if we can segregate communication of those devices to 
the IoT network, whichever is going to go ahead and give you the information. Now, what mistake as part of the attack which happened through uh, the, you know, what you call is uh, through the refrigerator, or probably somebody would like to go ahead and use high vision cameras, which has the capability to go ahead and uh, stream anything from internet from public network to your mobile device also. So a techie or a person who is a, you know, per, even if, you know, a little bit of knowledge of security would not like to go ahead and transmit any kind of information to his personal device, which are more vulnerable from the physical aspects. Rather than that, it could only be used for point to point communication at any point in time. So what I did was from my perspective is all my devices were having, you know, communication through telecommunication related uh, chips or numbers which we had and we started using those mobile data rather than using a Wi-Fi network which goes through an ISP which is more vulnerable. Now these kind of things would actually go ahead and help you is because only one device would get impacted if I'm connecting it to my laptop, if I'm connecting it to some other device. This is where, you know what, it is very important that embedded chips are also coming in certain devices, like in cars also they are not using any other kind of a public network rather than using a point-to-point -point communication from that car to it. This secures your physical devices from any kind of vulnerability. That is where, you know, Kamal said that what is the, you know, uh, reach that when you are reaching next to that particular car with 10 feet, 5 feet, then only you will be able to go ahead and operate on it. So you limit the area also for communication. So all those things actually create, a, you know, this ecosystem when you create of security around those. That is where, you know, you will benefit from security. There is no direct security measure which you can go ahead and implement it. Everything is vulnerable unless and until you go ahead and do a threat and vulnerability assessment. Unless and until somebody finds out that what is a loophole, you will never come to know about it. So con continuously, that is why we suggest on any particular company, any particular, you know, uh, what you call this compliance organization would keep on coming back to you on every quarter, do a risk analysis on top of it and then provide you the information. There are very few organizations who are technically competent enough till in today's time to go ahead and analyze anything which is a vulnerability from the IoT because it's a very new market which is budding up for the home appliances, home computers. But common public will never understand it. They will go ahead and connect all their devices to one and they will go ahead and stream that particular data on their mobility devices or try to control it from there, which, is may which will make him more vulnerable because you are never able to, you will never be able to go ahead and secure your mobility device. So that will be a very difficult task. That is why segregating them, keeping them to the nearest range when you're operating them is a better idea, I would suggest. That's it. Thank you.